Hello, Assalamualaikum everyone. My name is Suhad and thank you for tuning in uh, to my Facebook live session. I'm absolutely delighted to have with us today um, someone that I really admire and I look up to and someone who's truly international at everything that he does. Uh, we're joined today by Mr. Mark Garrett, who is a higher education expert. He's a vice chair of the university's marketing forum and the previous roles that he's held include being the Director of External Affairs at the University of Bradford, Director of Marketing, Recruitment and Communications at City University London and several other senior positions, both within higher education and also the corporate sector. Welcome, Mark. Assalamu alaikum, Fahad. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you, Mark. Um, and, you know, Mark, one thing that I really admire about Mark is that he is truly international. He's traveled and done business in over 60 countries. Um, obviously, in England, in Bradford, he was quite connected to the community there as well. Um, and he epitomizes everything that we, we call uh, a global international citizen. Um, so, Mark, it's an absolute pleasure again to be talking to you, especially in these challenging times where we're all locked down due to COVID um, and we're self-isolating. Um, so thank you again for, for joining us. You're welcome. So to kickstart the conversation, obviously we'll have lots to talk about uh, around international education, student recruitment, etc. But let's talk about something which is really pressing at the minute. Obviously, COVID-19, coronavirus, everyone's talking about it. We're all reading about it. Lots of information everywhere from social media to traditional mainstream media, etc. And you have a very personal experience of that. You've written a blog about it. Um, and obviously, you've been on the BBC radio um, on several times talking about this particular um, issue itself. So I'll, I'll leave you to sort of uh, give our audience a flavor of what your take on uh, coronavirus is. Um, and yeah, well, I got it. Um, <clears throat> so on the 15th of March, I started getting the symptoms and spent pretty much two weeks descending into a very dark place. Um, it was the most debilitating experience of my life. Um, I lost my sense of smell, taste, had the most incredible headaches that no headache tablet would, would, would solve. And so I really wasn't sleeping. Uh, I didn't eat for two weeks. I, um, I relied on um, isotonic drinks and water. Um, and uh, I got this most violent cough that at one point I thought, well, maybe I should um, go down to hospital. Um, the, the, the things I think I'd, I'd probably say is that if you do get it, <clears throat> you, the, there are three things I think that, that, that are really important. One is you have to trust the professionals. So after a week of being ill, I found the doctor, the GP. Um, I also managed to have a text chat with a chap who's an epidemiologist, and they both said, no, you've got the virus. I tried to convince my, my, um, my general practitioner that I'd got some um, bronchitis with added conditions. So I, I, I thought I'd become a doctor overnight. I was on uh, NHS 111. <clears throat> so, so you should trust the professionals. You should also trust, trust your, your understanding of your body, actually, and know when, I mean, I, I know if, 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 if the potential, what, there was one night I thought, I can't breathe. I did consider pressing 999 and go to hospital. But the other thing I, I would say is um, ignore friends and family's well-meaning um, views of the virus because um, they haven't got a clue. I think the thing that I'm seeing and we're all seeing is that it affects people in very different ways. So some people, my daughter got it and she only found out she got it um, because um, her, her boyfriend, who's a professional footballer, got tested for it. And um, But she got um, lack, um, a lack of smell and taste. But this was at the start when we were told you only had a cough or a fever. I mean, I had a temperature at times. So it affects people very differently is, is the other point. Um, <clears throat> but the real piece of advice is don't get it. It is really debilitating. And I've got a friend, actually a mutual friend that we, we have, Fahad, who has spent seven days in an intensive care unit and is now in a seven-day um, induced coma. And he's 38 years old. And 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 it, the notion that it just affects old people—I mean, I'm not that old; I'm only 54. But um, 
is 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 a nonsense. It can affect anybody. And so I think any country you're in, the advice that your government is giving you around self-isolating is just do it. And it's it's quite hard self-isolating, isn't it? And especially with with COVID nineteen, you don't really know how you get it, and you know the symptoms appear only 10, 14 days later um, as well. So I think a lot of people are finding it really hard um, to stay indoors. How have you sort of coped with that? Well, I'm probably lucky this is going to come out all wrong, but I'm, I live on my own. So whilst I had lots of good, well-meaning friends and family contacting me and trying to contact me, <clears throat> I, I mean, I've still got the cough, by the way. I mean, the, the other thing the other point to make is that this thing is, I'm week five now, and my lungs are shot because mm -hmm. I can't walk the hills. Um, I'm walking on the flat, but this is going to take a long time to get rid of. Mm -hmm. Self-isolation, I mean, the first few weeks, obviously, I was very, very ill. So it, didn't really it, 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 it didn't feel like I was actually self-isolating. <clears throat> I think now the point is, um, you know, it's like conversations like this. I mean, I, I, I'm lucky that I'm... Um, connected in the industry and I can now start engaging with people through the likes of Zoom and all these other yeah. technologies. I think it's important for your mental health and well-being that you can still connect with people. And mm -hmm. when we'll move on to international recruitment in yeah. a minute. I think this whole virus is going to revolutionise the way we all think. Mm -hmm. where we're and so I think dinosaur bosses who are not flexible with working practices um, will become extinct. Mm. And those of you who want to read Mark's blog about his personal experience of getting the coronavirus, the link's on your screen right now, so do do give it a read. He's also written about other things on, on this blog as well, so do do give it a, a read. And I'm moving swiftly on, Mark, and um, talking a little bit about your own personal journey. So I guess from Aberystwyth to the Army, and then marketing and communications, Confuse.com, and then the world of international education um, so just tell us a little bit about your own personal journey and how you entered the world of uh, I guess the university sector well I've, I've been a marketeer all my life and I think the one thread that comes throughout the whole of my career is I've been I've always been customer driven and customer relationship management even before it had that term was in my DNA and and and, and so I've been very lucky that I've had a lot of jobs where I've been able to apply that. I've worked for big brands like British Airways, uh, charities like Bernardo's, Royal Bank of Scotland, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so, that, so, so I think having a, having a thread in your career and an expertise is really important. Um, and as a result, I've applied that in the last 10 years in our education sector, where UK universities were pretty useless at marketing themselves. Um, they've got better over the years compared to the commercial operation, but I think it's having that having that thread is important. But in but also, if you want to become a global citizen, you, you've got to get out there and 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 travel the world. And I, and I I've been blessed, as you pointed out earlier on, to go to, you know go go to a variety of countries and actually be able to demonstrate some cultural competence. Mm -hmm. I think you and I worked together in in, in the past and. Uh, I think yeah, you know, we both got it actually. We both got the ability to connect with people, whoever they are, whatever level in society they think they're at, and at what uh, in whatever country. And in some respects, language. I mean, obviously, e English is the international language, but you've only got to do simple things like you know, say a few words in a different language to demonstrate you're actually interested in other people's um, cultures. And if you I mean, I mean, I, you, you've heard me say this before now, and I've, and I've said it at a few conferences. Um, there's a great quote by Bill Bullard, the author, that says, opinion is the lowest form of human knowledge, but empathy is the highest form of human knowledge. And I think my advice to people in terms of becoming a global citizen, you've got to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. I understand that's someone else's perspective. And right now, COVID-19, the coronavirus, is really drawing out who the great leaders are and who the bad leaders are. I mm -hmm. watched by Barack Obama yesterday. He was he was promoting um, Joe Biden becoming the next president, but all of a sudden I I, I saw a, pre, um, a a guy who is presidential, yeah, um, the the prime minister of New Zealand's in the same category, 
And what they have is empathy. They're prepared to understand other people's perspective. And, and, and that's the other piece of advice is, is if you, if you're going to be successful in, in the world, you've got to really try and understand someone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and just sort of bringing conversation towards higher education and, and sort of looking at your own personal experience. You've, you've done marketing for the corporate sector. So worked for the likes of RBS or British Airways, and you've also then worked for the public sector or, or the university. So, um, I guess my question is when it comes to marketing or commercialization, how have you found the, the, like, what are the similarities or differences between sort of trying to market higher education or to sell higher education compared to the more traditional corporate entities? Um, well, it's been a challenge in the last 10 years. Um, you know, a lot of people think that you can just, students will come because of your brand and reputation. And of course, not every university is ranked very, very highly. So it's not that easy. And so the notion of having to go out and market and sell are things that are anathema to some people still in the higher education sector. Having said that, we work on a global stage. The Australian universities, you know, have been right right from the start, you know, commercial in their outlook. The Americans to a point. And now we've got China. I mean, I, mean, I don't know what's going to happen with China in terms of post, post virus, but you know, the fact that, 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 that there's, there's hundreds of thousands of people going to study in China in English at universities. Mm -hmm. it's like, wow. I mean, it, the, 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 these are the competitive pressures. And so um, I think we're getting more and more commercial in the UK, um, which is why we've got nearly half a million international students studying in the UK. But, um, I mean, I remember when I um, introduced CRM, technology at Bradford to what was then the international office um, and they were the biggest resistors because they thought it was like big brother working out you know what how successful they were at different events mm. and I was, a bit, I was a bit taken aback by this response because it's like well yeah so we want to know whether going to that particular event is a good thing or a bad thing now of course coronavirus and the aftermath of it is going to, I think, radically change international recruitment and our approaches in mm. in the coming years. Mm. And we've got a we've got a question from Noor, who works at Bangor University in North Wales. So she's asking, are we going to see UK universities working closely together during and post COVID nineteen? And I guess as as your your role of being vice chair of University Marketing Forum be quite interesting. Well, no, we've got um, we've got all the mar so I've set up with um, Justin Cole, who's the chair of the University's Marketing Forum. We've now got a weekly Zoom call, and we, we invite it's up to 100 marketing directors, communications directors, international, um, to come onto the call and listen to to policymakers. And tomorrow we've got Claire Marchant, who's the um, UCAS chief exec. And um, what I'm observing um, is that we are starting to see uh, marketing directors actually starting to think about how they do work more closely together because this challenge is for all of us. We're all competitors on one level, um, but I think what we're starting to see is a much more collaborative approach. And I'd like to think going forward, you know, the use of these sort of technologies like Zoom will allow us to get together and talk about particular subjects I mean, we've got British Council coming up in a couple of weeks as well to talk about international. Um, so, so, so I, I'm seeing um, opportunities for that to happen right now, um, and I'm hopeful that we will see this going forward. Um, but we shall see. Well, well one thing mm -hmm. we are doing interestingly, we, we're we're setting up a Zoom call. It'll be eight o'clock in the morning in the UK with all the marketing directors from the UK and the marketing directors from the Australian universities. Now that That'd is be quite interesting. That, yeah. that is radical. Yeah. Um, mm. And Case Europe is setting that up. Now that is, that's going to be fantastic to mm. have, be able to bring from, you know, cross continents, marketing directors to talk about these subjects. Fantastic. And in, in your view, Mark, like when we look at internationalization of the UK has been doing it for a long time and in many ways, I guess UK was one of the, the early, um, you know, sort of 
I would say um, the destinations that were quite active in promoting itself as a destination long before Australia, New Zealand, and other destinations came in. So, do you, do do you feel UK does international in a slightly different way compared to the likes of Canada, New Zealand, Australia, or do you think um, it's quite similar? Well, I think what's happened is, is like a lot of these things you, that the the brand of um, the higher education of the UK has had a cachet for longer. Mm. Yeah. So Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand particularly have all had to work harder. W what I do think is different is that Canada, Australia, New Zealand have had a much more joined up approach with a gov government policy and, and a government strategy um, in order to help universities and, and, and set targets. Um, now, now it feels, I mean, the UK's growth has been quite sluggish. It's been single digit over the last few years last decade, um, whereas whereas those three countries have had double digit growth in America mm -hmm. too. So, so they've become much more, they were much more commercial earlier on because they had to be. It's a bit like UK universities. You've got, you know, I mean, look at, I mean, Coventry, we always put up there as a, as a university that's, I mean, if you look at the top 10 recruiting universities internationally, Coventry are one of these outliers. They're not Russell Group. Yeah, mm -hmm. so they've done a kind of like a, a Canada and a, a New Zealand and a, and, a, and a, um, Australia, when when, if, when they've been really commercial and aggressive and got out there. So I think yeah. UK universities are going to have to it, the Russell even the Russell groups. You know, you you're still going to have to work harder going forward. I think. Mm. And I need to ask you this question because we were in a in a in a webinar or a meeting was yesterday and the million dollar question was how could universities move from the traditional student recruitment methodologies to the digital sphere um what is your take on that well, a million dollar question upsetting any international officers that might not be listening in <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's be honest people set about getting into international recruitment um one because they you know they like engaging with people and two because they like travel and and so I think we're going to have to have a mixed model going forward. Um, as you know, in Bradford, we devolved into more of a regional approach rather than having people fly from Bradford to all parts of the world because that was just the most sensible thing to do. So I think what's going to happen is there's going to be more consideration about having people and operations in country because, you know, potentially the globalisation project is at risk going forward. Um, I mean, at a simple level, you know, my neighbours here are talking more about going to the butcher and the local fruit and veg shop rather than the supermarket because it's local. And mm -hmm. I think it's that way. So I think there's going to be more of um, universities considering people being devolved into regions. I think, secondly, we're all now, we all now know we can use this technology, right? And we all now know that. You know, face to face is important. I understand that, but it's not the only thing. Yeah. So I think there's going to be more use of pressure. I mean, I know when I return to a university and I'm responsible for international, I'll be pressing this going, OK, let's look at the cost of travel. You know, there's a balance. Yeah. So I think there'll be more digital. I think um, <clears throat> there potentially might be use more use of the whole virtual technologies there are some great ones out there at the moment i mean uk universities have had to do virtual open days in the last few months yeah so i think there'll be more pressure to ensure we've got top dollar virtual experience whilst having this conversation i mean i, I could have this conversation with with uh, you know a pakistan student in islamabad yeah. assuming they've got the right access and wi-fi i understand all those things there's no reason why we can't have this conversation. Um, it, I mean, Noor just made the point, indeed, regional hubs supported by the technology. Absolutely spot on. I, I absolutely agree that's where, the, where, we, where we're going with it. Yeah. Um, in terms of that question, none of us actually work at University of Bradford anymore, uh, but I'm sure there, um, having measures in place 
uh, for the September intake. And I know a lot of universities are going towards that blended approach, particularly around uh, the pre-sessional English, isn't it, Mark? Yes, and and um, that that's going to you know the, w what's happened in the last few months is that universities that have sat around making deci deciding whether to do something has changed. Now they're doing having to do things because they're in a crisis. And what we'll find yeah. will be more flexibility about pre-sessional English. I mean, e even the government are going to have to be more flexible about allowing international students in. We're, we're going to have to because. Mm -hmm. and they, you know, that they're over 20, 28 billion pound impact on our economy in special students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so, so I know a number of other universities are putting in um, particular pre-sessional courses. I also know that universities are being flexible now that they're thinking about when when students start. Mm -hmm. I personally feel there'll be a massive increase in number of January starts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they've got to be. So, so then, all of a sudden, universities are going to have to uh, think about that long term, anyway. Hmm. And we've got a question from Ramla. She works at Macquarie University in Australia. So, uh, her question is: If the global economies go into a recession, how will that impact demand for international higher education? Um, I think it depends. Um, it depends on each country. My, my, view, my view on these things is so the, the data set we're going to look, we're going to have to look at now, is not not just um, uh, whether lockdown is being lifted in a particular country. We're going to have to look at whether travel's being lifted, and we're going to have to look at you know how people perceive their own health system versus another health system. So, uh, so Rimmler's question is a really good one that. Which I can't, I can't answer. But there will always still, there will always be a middle class who've got to decide where they want to send their their students. So if I, if I've been really rude about it, Chinese students. Well, we, we know colleagues are now going back to work in China. Um, uh, I think British Council did a piece of analysis the other day, which showed that forty percent of prospective Chinese students that were going to go abroad are still on the fence. Um, but I think eventually they'll come off the fence because <clears throat> there's still a massive demand for international education. I think the question is, so let's take the UK, will, will the perception of the parents in China be that they can send their child to the UK and if there's a second wave of this, will their child be safe? Yeah. So I don't, I don't think it's necessarily about it being the, that being the luxury end, there are obviously going to be middle and upper class that are going to still be around to spend money, and there continue to be a latent demand. Um, now, of course, if we go into recession, there'll be some people that will be hit by it, but I, it depends. I mean, I, you know, if you're a student in India, for instance, I mean, I can only see what I see on the TV. You've got massive lockdown. Um, you've got a health system that can't cope. If you're a middle upper class parent in India, you, you're not going to stop your plans to send your child to the UK, uh, particularly with the post to work visa. I don't, I don't feel. I mean, I've yeah, got no absolutely. Yeah. But, 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 but time will tell. So I, I, I think, um, I, I do think countries like Nigeria, though, Ramla's point's well made. I think countries like Nigeria, where there's a massive price sensitivity to um, people paying for education. I think there will be some impacts in countries like that. Mm -hmm. And and what would you say, like in terms when we talk about international education, obviously T and E, uh, you know, comes up quite a bit, and a lot of people are now talking about. Well, what would potential implications of COVID-19 be, you know, with a lot of investment going into online delivery and blended learning? Would you say overseas branch campuses or blended learning? Do you think it would come to a point where it is competing with the UK brick and mortar approach? Um, I don't think it'd be competing, but I think there'll be complementarity about it. I think um, we're now proving we can you know, we can get people mobilised to teach distance learning, yeah? And, and a number of universities do that anyway. Um, I think um, I think the 
the thing is that it will depend on each country. Um, I mean, we took a view at Bradford that we didn't want to do branch campuses because we thought it was a bit too colonial. Well, of course, now I think a number of universities are going to start looking at T and E and branch campus, or, or or at least some form of you know, some form of partnership where it's taught locally. Um, maybe consider more. Hmm. Phil's asked the question. Um, hi, Phil. We know Phil. Um, <laughs> Do we think the situation can transform the market with more TNE franchise and deal? I'm not sure that I'd use the word transform, Phil, but I think <clears throat> I do think we're all going to have to start reconsidering our perspective on those those things, uh, and also be able to consider, you know, the blended learning approach. Um, but I don't think we should do a sledgehammer to crack a nut. I mean, we, you know, at some point there will be a vaccine. Um, but we need to prepare ourselves for if these things happen again. Mm. But I would, rather than be just um, dogmatic about not doing it, I do think more of us are going to have to start thinking about a bit, a bit, bit, a bit more flexibly. Mm. And actually, this reminds me of another um, element of this question around location. So Phil obviously works at York St. John's University, um, and they have a London campus as well. So. You know, a lot of UK universities struggle with the location as well, you know, beyond London or Manchester. You know, I remember from my time in Scotland, you know, location plays a big part. So, you know, a lot of universities are now looking at those Manchester, or Birmingham or London campuses. What is what is your view on that? Well, it's difficult sometimes for um, for some universities that that are not in the big centre to be able to promote themselves. So you, you always get universities on the periphery of London sticking London in their brand. Um, you know, I was looking, I just happened to be looking at Aston the other day, and I see now they've put Birmingham UK in their brand. Um, but ultimately, as you know, Fad, if, you, if you've got the right product, to use that phrase, um, you've got the right messaging and, and uh, marketing to to promote then you, you can get people to anyway i mean if you look at you know where's aberdeen but aberdeen have got i don't know five six thousand students on campus internationally dundee you know yeah. you were dundee where's dundee apart from a place that make cakes um if you've got the right people out there selling the right product um that then then I don't think you have to be necessarily in a, a big city. Although when you look at the stats, I mean a lot of universities, the big ones, have got large numbers of international students. I mean Manchester obviously benefits from having two extremely successful football clubs. Yes, yes. So do Liverpool. Liverpool do really well in Egypt. Uh, yeah. just because of more more salah. Yeah. 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 I think when um Hull had uh a kocha who played for Nigeria, they had a massive spike in Nigerian students. So there's there's a whole range of factors that, that affect it. I don't think it's just about being a big city. Hmm. And, you know, when we look at, obviously, the landscape of international recruitment over the last, let's say, a decade or so, UK had it really tough with government policies, no post-study work visa, you know, a lot of visa rejections, etc. And then the sector as a whole, um, you know, we, we lobbied to get you know, some concessions from the government and the post-study work uh, was back. And now suddenly we're back to almost square one with um, COVID-19. So it seems like there's no, never a dull moment in our in our jobs. Well, there isn't. And there are lots of factors now that universities are going to have to take into consideration, which is why the government are considering, you know, putting in um, a, a student number cap to prevent the Russell Group deciding to lower their tariff because they don't think they're going to get as many international students because Russell Group, we know, get the bulk of international students. So there's a whole load of factors in there. But, you know, you know me well. I'm, I'm not an Armageddon theorist. I, I, I'm always glass half full. And, and I think, you know, if we look at a market by market basis, we, we, we've, got a, we've, got a, we've got a scenario plan how we get our way out of this. And we've got a question. 
So what the question is, what, what made you think that recruiting more international than local students would benefit the university? Well, I think it's a balance. I mean, in the UK, this is this year is the final year of the reduction in number of 18 year olds. So the size of demand in the UK has been reducing over a number of years. I think going going forward now, it's going to increase exponentially. So that there will be just as many local students um, coming to university. But I don't think it's an either or. Certainly, universities like Bradford, it's um, it wasn't it wasn't a cap on places. Um, but I do think um, I mean in, in so, so you've had a, a reduction in number of eighteen year olds in the UK. And you continue to have an increase in the number of, in the demand from international students wanting to go and study somewhere else. So by definition, you get an increase in international students. And of course, international students bring money to this economy. Um, you know, I think I say Universities UK says so it's 28 billion. If you work out, so if, if, if the 40% of students in China don't actually come, they sit on the fence, then get off the fence and decide they're not going to come, paying £17,000 a year average, right? And then you add the one and a half times they spend typically in, in this economy. Just that alone will have a £2 billion negative impact on our economy. Just that alone. So, yeah. so um, they do, international students do contribute, they do provide a richness to the to campuses, but it's not at the, it's not at the um, expense of, of local students. Um, certainly not in Bradford. I mean, we we encourage all students, local students, to come to university. And in fact, most universities, yeah. even the likes of York, um, are pretty regional. Mm. And not to forget the the cultural and the academic um, enrichment that they bring with them. Absolutely. Yeah. And just sort of talking a little bit about the economy, we'd be sort of speculating. But what would you say? Like, obviously, you know, the UK government has had to big uh, had to give a big um, sort of uh, chunk of money to to fight the COVID nineteen situation. And you know, eventually, when things calm down, when the budgets get balanced out, would you think that the universities would would have to take a hit because of this? Or well, um, Alistair Jarvis, who's the chief exec of Universities UK put out a piece the other day. It was in the Guardian newspaper, and he's basically calling for um, two million, two billion pound, um, to a two billion pound um, um, fund to um, uh, universities. So I do, I do think universities will need to be considered because some might um, um, do worse off. There was another question. And, uh, yeah, there is actually. It's a comment. Um, well, Emma, you're asking a question about um, wanting to specifically increase international students and disregard local students. And that, that wasn't the case, actually. I, I, I have to disagree with you there. Um, as I said earlier on, the number of 18 year olds and the participation rates in Yorkshire have been reducing year on year. Um, I think you might find last year we had a 27% increase in applications from local students and actually 40% of the UK um, students come from two constituencies in Bradford. So um, I'm going to have to challenge your stats there. That being said, and as I say the number of 18 year olds has gone down, that being said, um, the numbers are going to increase now in terms of the number of 18 year olds um, in the region, but there's still the participation rates are not as high. So um, the growth in international, um, which the, that Bradford has had, has come from focusing on particular markets. Hmm. And, you know, when we look at sort of September intake, no one knows whether it's going ahead or not. There are lots of speculation around it. Obviously, the sector has lost key recruitment period in April, May, June, the exams. No one really knows what's going to happen. So what's your sort of, uh, I would say, judgment of that, like based on like, you know, how quickly can the sector sort of jump back on? If, if the restrictions are lifted? Or would you say September 2020 should just be sort of disregarded? Well, 
look, I mean, I don't think we're going to be in lockdown until September. Um, they're already now talking government around how they start releasing things. We've started to see that in Spain and Italy. I think I think what we'll end up with is I, I don't I, I kind of don't feel we we are going to necessarily delay massively. There's going to be a clearing, and and I'll put money on this now that I think clearing will be the same day as it has been for the last twenty years. We'll have a clearing day. It's just that the way students get their grades will be different. We will have a clearing day. Uh, everyone will get their results on the same day, and um, that I, I personally believe that will be a similar time scale. But that's going to come out in the next week, I think. And um, so that's the first thing. Secondly, um, I think we will have to have there'll be some restrictions on social distancing, and actually psychologically, we'll we will socially distance ourselves. I mean, I you know I've I've come out of having the virus myself, and I and I've gone down the shop thinking completely differently. In the way I approach things, so I suspect we will um, we will have a situation whereby we'll probably have to self-impose only certain number of students in a lecture theatre, etc., etc., etc. But um, I'm not convinced that necessarily delaying things must. I think we'll have we'll probably need more flexibility around um, you know when students arrive, particularly international. And I think we'll need to put those measures in play. But mm -hmm. I like it's quite flexible. I know we certainly wasn't. We were at Bradford. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of a comment from Noor from Bangor. Um, big shout out to Noor uh, from Bangor. She does a splendid job in the Middle East market for Bangor. Um, and until very recently, I think it's still true that Bangor is the number one destination for Saudi students in the UK which is quite a surprising statistic for me. But again, it goes on to show that, you know, if you you work hard and you've got the right people um, in the right markets, you know, it doesn't have to be London or Manchester or Russell Group even. Absolutely not. I think Bang is a really good case. I mean, I mean, I studied at Aberystwyth back in the 1980s and I remember lots of international students there in Aberystwyth. And Aberystwyth is, where's Aberystwyth, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I think absolutely. And I think she uh, knows right, there will be lots of positive stories that will come out that already are now. The way the way communities have been brought together in this country has been quite staggering. We just need to make sure that the, the government, or whichever colour it is, um, um, continu continues now to properly invest in our health and social care system. And, and what would you say, like a lot of people that are watching are professionals working in international recruitment, so uh, recruitment agents, colleagues from universities, um, you know, what would you say, like in terms of obviously the lockdown, it's quite daunting to be indoors. How can we all sort of stay motivated and stay productive um, and plan for the, the, the world that's going to emerge after, after COVID-19? Um, well, I think remain positive and start thinking about planning. I mean, particularly in our world, um, we should all be planning, scenario planning what the potential options might be. I suspect you're probably going to get the finance directors of all the universities wanting you to do that anyway. Um, but be positive. I mean, I, I've always said this. I think I said this to you, Fad, um, in the time we worked together. If you wake up in the morning and say, today's going to be a good day, it usually is, right? Yeah. If you wake up in the morning and say, it's going to be a bad day, it usually is. And so... Um, Lots of positives can come out of this. Lots of positives for the um, education sector. Um, and But I think it will allow us to think much more creatively around how we interact with um, potential students coming to the UK particularly um, going forward. And I think we, we can just put the rule, we can, we can tear the rule book up. What a great opportunity for that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And and finally, Mark, my last question to you. Um, in the post-COVID-19 world, would you see any any shifts in the key markets that we all work in? So the likes of China, India, Pakistan, Nigeria, or would you say there'd be some shifts in, in, in these core markets that we've all sort of taken for granted for many years? Well, I don't think there will be for India and China. Um, at all, I think there's such, such enormous markets. I think there will be a challenge with Nigeria, and Nigeria is the big number, obviously in in Africa. 
Um, I think the likes of you know of the Southeast Asian or sort of South Asian markets, um, there are still opportunities for growth there, as you know. Um, mm. It'd be interesting to see what happens with America, actually. Um, America's now getting a bad press with our friend uh, President Trump um, changing his mind every day um, and it exposing the healthcare system. Mm-hmm. Um, so I suppose people will be looking at... They'll, I, I think people's decision-making will be starting to look with different different um, data sets, like I say. Mm-hmm. So I think things like the health system, and, and, and I'm not, this isn't a political point, I think, you know, I'm hoping that it will be proven that, you know, we didn't do a bad job in this country. It's 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 shocking that, you know, the amount of deaths we've already had, but the strategy always was to, um, you know, limit the pressure on the National Health Service. And if what comes out of this is that we have a much better National Health Service, I think we can promote that as a, pe- a positive benefit of being in the UK should this happen again. Yeah. And we've got a question from Rizwan, who works at British Council of Saudi Arabia around uh, September intake. Yeah, well, I think, as I said earlier on, I don't, I don't think it will be postponed. I mean, I think there might be some flexibility around September, October. And I think different institutions will approach it based on their own capabilities and capacity to do it. Um, but I don't think we'll be in, we won't be in lockdown in September. I just think we'll have to put well, each of these. Um, and if you have, yeah. yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, drop them in the the comment section below. Um, if not, any any final thoughts, Mark? Well, so um, Omar, who. Um, Challenged me on Bradford. I love the discussion, Emma. Um, hopefully, we can have that again on on, on Facebook. Um, but I think um, be positive. All, all of us have to think positively about the opportunities this creates. Not be um, slitting our wrists thinking that the whole international market is going to collapse. Because for sure, parents will still want their children to have the education they they want for them that they maybe didn't have themselves and and the way to do that is through international great thank you so much mark for your time and we're all trying to stay positive and motivated and and these series of live interviews is one way of staying connected but also sort of sharing best practices and um, you know keeping each, each other sane in these testing times Thank you for your time and your contributions. And also thank you to all uh, my friends and colleagues who were tuned in and they asked um, questions. Um, should we take some more questions, Mark? Or, well, there's a question from Bilal, who runs an agency in Pakistan. Okay. Um, what will be the impact of the pandemic on future forecasting student recruitment? Should we expect lower down or should we be keep recruiting? <clears throat> well, like I say, if, if we stay positive, um we, we should hopefully um still see um s- some decent recruitment um i think um <clears throat> we do need a scenario plan though you, you you're gonna have to do that with your finance director because finance directors typically are always wary of sales people like us and they never quite believe our numbers and so finance directors and universities will be even more skeptical about our mm. we need to have more data to prove. Yeah, and I guess for, from Bilal's perspective, because he runs a, a student recruitment agency, the business model would be slightly different. So I guess for agents, they'll have multiple intakes, multiple products, even multiple destinations. So I guess a very careful view on, on the different products that they have and the available intakes would be quite important to sort of... Um, yeah, so I think you'll, you'll, be able, you'll have more flexibility around intake by more universities. Great, and a shout out to Shahid as well, our mutual friend from Leicester. Hello, Hello yeah. Shahid. Yeah. yeah, and Katrina from Edinburgh, thank you for tuning in, Katrina. Much appreciated, and Rizwan. Well, with that, we'll bring the session to close. Thank you once again, everyone, for watching, and inshallah, we'll bring another one of these sessions to you, um, and hope we can all stay together, uh, stay at home, stay safe, stay healthy and take care of yourselves. Thank you. God bless.